as I mentioned earlier, Brent is in the Gold Coast and now in Brisbane um, doing meetings, doing a conference with Faelene Hill that you may remember from many years ago, visited Encounter here. But um, it's my pleasure to be able to um, remind you that his books are on sale. His new book is out um, at the table there along with the other three. He sold all the books he took over to the conference, so um, <laughs> he's very excited about that. And uh, there just seems to be um, such a, a hunger for the gift on his life um, in these situations. I think we get quite used to it here in, at Encounter, but when he goes somewhere new, it's just full on and all on. He arrives back tomorrow night and we leave again that same night um, to go to Singapore. It's not all work. I just have to say we've booked in a couple of days um, holiday there before we begin a conference up in Singapore. We've been there over many years um, doing many things in Singapore and it's, it's, it's an amazingly open place um, for Brent to minister into. Um, but I'm here this morning and absolutely delighted. Those of you who were following what I was going to be preaching about will recall, and I can see anticipation on every face, that I'm going to be talking about the journey of a prophet's wife. That is because he's called his book The Journey of the Prophet. So I thought The Journey of the Prophet Wife would at least get you all here out of curiosity to see what it is that I'm going to say. <laughs> but um, just straight up, I'm very different from Brent. I'm different. My gift is different, and I know that. And the nature of is very different. It's sort of a miracle that we sort of complement each other and, and live the way we do, you know, <laughs> because, of, because of the differences that are inherent within us. And rather than talk about my journey as the prophet's wife too much, um, I, I've more taken it from an angle of seeing beyond. And I think that is what a prophetic person does. They see beyond the natural where we look at and into the realm of God or to the supernatural area where God is. And sometimes I liken this to, you know, how you look at, at those 3D pictures and you can look at it and it's one thing and then you just let your eyes unfocus a bit and you see a whole different world behind. Well, it's a little bit like that when when I talk about seeing beyond. It's seeing beyond the natural thing that is in front of you. However, being Brent's wife and him carrying this prophetic gift has been a journey that I can only describe as incredible. You know, he's, he has a boldness to, to go into places and to, and to begin to pray for people, and especially when we began to move into... Um, Dr. Khan's ministry and assist him there with the Vietnamese people. I would look at this crowd of Vietnamese, and I did it as well when we were in um, Zimbabwe with Colin and Sarah doing those massive big conferences, and I'd look at this crowd and I'd think, right, to me they all look the same. And I'd be like, oh, surely, how can, you know, they're, they're all the same. I don't know them, I've never spoken to them. And he would begin to move in that prophetic gift and begin prophesying over some of them and having words of knowledge. And, and you, uh, my eyes would be opened. I'm like, how does he know this stuff? How does he know this person is different to that one? And this is all in, in, a, in a public setting. And what if he's got it wrong? What if he's talking about one of them who he's regarding as a leader and they're the, the worst person in this place and all this kind of fear would be there a bit and I'd be like... It's all right, it's all right, you know, and it was all right. It's amazing. He has a gift of an accurate, pro prophetic word of knowledge over and over again that brings this massive move of God. Sometimes we've been in these conferences in, in these kind of um, different cultural sit situations, and they build and they build and they build over the days until finally there's just like this massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. First time we ever went to Zimbabwe, I think there was a conference of around 3,000. 
Zimbabweans. I've forgotten the end that we were the only Europeans there, possibly in all of Bulawayo at the time because of all the troubles there. And I remember that they'd, they'd got these chairs, these plastic chairs out. And by the time he finished in the final meeting with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the deliverance that, that was just erupting around the place, there was not one of these chairs standing. They just scattered for miles. And I thought, this is incredible. This has taken me into situations that on my own I would never have seen. I would never have, have been able to witness. I would never have been able to be a part of. And for that, I am blessed to be married to him and joined in ministry with whatever we do and wherever we go. And I'm believing for that in Singapore as well. He doesn't only do that in, in a big setting, but he'll do that behind the scenes um, with, with church leaders and things like this. Because one of his big aims is to bring freedom into a church situation and unlock it where it's been locked down and to let the Holy Spirit flow freely, not only on the Sunday meetings, but in the lives of people. And with that, I've been privileged also to be, be with him, to support that and bring my own level of ministry into those kind of smaller environments or more intimate environments. So that's my journey as the... Um, as, a journey of a prophet's wife, that's me. I think that's enough about that side of it because I want to focus us on what is my message really burning here today. And at the end of when I'm preaching, I'm going to pray. I'm going to, and also I'm going to invite the ministry team up to pray for healings, to pray for any needs that you have. I do not want anybody to move from this place today and think to themselves, I wish somebody could have prayed for me, because we'll have that opportunity right at the end of this morning. But I've called this message Seeing Beyond, and I have always had, since I was a child, this kind of affinity with what was beyond the natural world. You could say I'm a bit of a dreamer, I am. There's music all the time pumping through my head, um, so the two kind of go together. I can go into another world just like that and turn a CD on in my head and start dreaming about God and his wonderful universe and the creator and all the rest of it. And linked with that has been the ability to and the desire to have memorized much scripture. And it's that that takes me into the world beyond. You know, the knowledge of the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That can get me right out there. The knowledge of the glory of God is going to cover this earth as the waters cover the sea. That's in the Bible. And I imagine that. I dream away. I'm not so much interested what's happening on the TV or on anything else. I'm thinking, how does the knowledge of the glory of God, how is it going to cover the earth? Is it going to be through Facebook, Twitter, that people find out this knowledge about the glory of God? But it is going to cover the earth. The knowledge of the glory of God is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And so I dream away about the day that comes where everybody on this earth will have knowledge of God's glory in their midst as surely as the waters have covered the sea. You are never going to cruise on a seabed while God is on the throne. There are waters covering the sea, and his glory is going to cover this whole earth. That gets me seeing beyond. That gets me praying beyond. That gets me linking beyond with a time that is yet to come. Sometimes I like to think about what happens and what is happening right now around the throne of God. I beheld and I heard, said the writer of Revelation, the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders saying with a loud voice, blessing, honor, glory and power to him who sits on the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. I go right in there. I see beyond, seeing beyond, experiencing beyond, hearing music 
that the, these angelic hosts are singing, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Oh my goodness, any one of us can do this. That's where I live, that's where I go, that's where I link the presence of God with the scriptures in the Bible and go to these places and see beyond because I know if I can touch those realms as often as possible, that's what I can bring into my ministry and into this church here and for everyone who I pray for. When I see that, when I go into that realm, I, I recall, I'm just going to pause, this is not in my notes, but I do recall at one point we were as a music group forming years ago and we began to pray and, and it was in the sort of early move of the Holy Spirit and it was awesome and suddenly, without even asking God, there was such a rise of worship from our team and I was, felt like I was up there and I could see all of this worship happening. It was almost like a, a beehive pulsating with the angelic host and I knew that the presence of God was in the middle of all this, you know, sort of activity all around it. I was right on the edge and the, the music was just, it was exquisite. It just went on and on and on. And there was a pile on the edge of manuscripts of music and I could actually read the notes on the first one. And a gentle breeze just seemed to pick that piece of paper up and it fluttered down to the earth. And I thought, God, that's what I want. That's what I want, that song. <laughs> and I want songs that come from the throne of God that our team can put into music here and bless not only this church but our nation and beyond. And Brent has got our little CD chip thing over there and with our three winning songs on it, selling those as well. But, you know, I went there. I heard it, seeing beyond, experiencing beyond. Do you like this? Right, and wouldn't it be awesome to worship like that? I loved the other week when I was here, I stood on the stage and I was starting to see something in the music that we were singing. We sang it again this morning. He sent the darkness running out of an empty tomb. And remember, I began to speak to you because I knew and I know again sitting here today, there are some of you that have got situations that are in darkness and in an empty tomb, sitting and in a tomb with a stone in front of it, just like we were singing. Now, if the power of God can move that stone away, the darkness can be removed and a light can come into that dark place and an angel stand there and tell those disciples, he is not here, he is risen, then that same God can do that same thing for you, absolutely, that if you have situations or anything, a relationship, your business, your thought patterns, anything that is sitting in a dark place, God can have that changed. He can remove those powers of darkness from a tomb like that and bring you into a different place at any second, at any time. He is awesome. I started to see that. So this week, I've lived in that realm, seeing beyond. And for many of you whose situations I know that are a little bit stuck in various areas, let me assure you that I've been praying for you up the Tram Valley Road as I drive up there because I want to see God move in your situations and bring light where there is darkness in that empty tomb. Wow, isn't that awesome? This week... We were privileged, really, to have um, Denise Cooper in town, and she had something cancelled for her, and she came to the ladies' group that, that we meet together monthly, a group of us. She's an awesome prophet. She is absolutely incredible. And she began to tell us her life story again, and at the precise moment that she started to really see in the spirit realm, seeing beyond, seeing, seeing stuff that I have never seen, I have to admit. But she sees this all the time. I would love to be like that. I'm not there yet. I'm open for that, God. I tell him this. And she's in a, in a totally different way of viewing everything. 
And it was our privilege, really, when she began to pray for our ladies and prophesy over them, that the very essence of the, some of them were prophetic words I've heard before, that she did not know these people, our ladies, and she just came and accurately nailed it again and again. Most specifically was you, Emily. She did not know that God has already spoken by previous prophets about you um, moving around the world, but the first thing she saw was, was Emily on the world, stepping from country to country to country. I thought I would leave this world at that kind of talk. But accurate prophet coming and praying for us and affirming again the call of God on, on the lives that were there. She was fabulous. She was awesome. And I thought, what a privilege. The, the voice of the prophet the journey of a prophet. And she's had her journey, but my gosh, is she strong in the spirit. My goodness, is she strong when she prays and releases that word of the Lord like that. And we began to talk again about the vision that she had seen for encounter some years ago, about five years ago when she came here, four years ago at my request. If you recall, if you were here on a Mother's Day, and a lady from Christchurch was here speaking, that was her. And so <clears throat> I was away on the Sunday. I do believe it was my dear uncle's 90th birthday. So that would have been three years ago because he's 93. Now he started escaping from the residential care home in Kaitaia. Oh, my goodness. He was all right for a while, but then every day he gets his little walker and it's got a basket thing in it. He puts his various things he thinks he needs and trots out the front gate. It's going to, my father's coming apparently with the truck and they're going to do the haymaking. My father has been gone for 30 something years. But anyway, so they bring him back. But now, so he didn't like this too much. So he, he used to be a farmer and he, um, he used to get his cows. So now he says to the nursing staff, where are my cows? And um, anyway, so he, he went to an enclosed deck. This is an enclosed deck, normal size rails, at three o'clock when he thought the cows should be coming in. And he chucked his walker over the deck, and got over himself, got through the neighbor's fence and was making for the Okahau Hills to get the cows in. They just thought they'd like to tell me that. And I said, well, he always did say if I put him in there, he'd escape. So he's making good his escape. So when he was 90 years old, um, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with him at all. <laughs> so there you go, this could go on. When he was 90, I wasn't here that day. That's what got me on to three and a half years ago. Um, I wasn't here, and Denise was here. And I met with her the night before, or the Friday night before I left, and she'd had an open-eyed vision of encounter. And she was trembling when she was telling me this. It was so real to her. We were so impressed by what she preached that day that we had her vision copied out word for word and distributed. And I may just do that again. Because her vision was like this. She said, the book of encounter has been written. It is the foundation of everything you do in this place. All the good things you have done, all the amazing things over the years, all the conferences, the camps, the music we have written, all of our ministries is already written in that book, along with the difficult things in the church's history, and along with every person's story that has come into this church and affected it, good and bad, it's already there written. And God wants to write some new chapters at Encounter Here. And from the foundations of this church, or the book, up came these, these transparent walls. And while she was telling me, we were at dinner in Newmarket. And we, it was a rainy night. And I'm telling you that they'd put those perspex flaps down on three sides. And there we were with these see-through walls. And sometimes the lights were coming in, cars and various colors. And as she's describing this, she's touching these walls. And she said, it was like this. There's a transparency in encounter here, we are a real transparent people. We do not put things on that are, are not real. We are a transparent people and we must maintain and retain that quality at the church because as these walls go up, 
That is people's stories in the walls. And anybody who comes in here can touch these walls and can identify with what has been in the church here and always know that there is hope for them. And she talked about that and she heard God say, do not take the hope out of encounter. That was a word that she heard clearly. And she began to tell us that again on Wednesday night. And if there's any mission that I feel in, it's bringing people into a dynamic encounter with Jesus Christ, always bringing hope, always allowing every person who walks through these doors to find hope and to find something of God that will forever bring light to that darkness, that will forever change the situation that they find themselves in. There is nobody who has done anything that is not welcome in this place to touch those transparent walls and feel like we identify with them and never, ever judge them. My goodness, that was powerful. So that was Denise this week, and she began to talk about the importance of each of us who carry a ministry to be vigilant at this time, to be active, to take this day of opportunity to see God begin to write these further chapters in the story of encounter. I have seen beyond. I want to just bring you two stories um, that are very real to me. But I've alluded here at some points that when I was young, very little, maybe around the age of three, that kind of age, I was still very, very unwell, very sick. And um, I had overheard my parents talking with the doctors. I'd been sent to another room in the hospital when we were about to leave. And the doctors said, there's no point bringing her back in here again. There is nothing further we can do for her. Too much of my skin was completely covered in eczema. The um, asthma and related problems of pneumonia had just built up until I was almost, almost unable to, to be as a normal child. In fact, I couldn't play with the other kids. If kids were playing outside, I was on the bed. Not that I minded because I'd memorized the whole of the Messiah. My father used to sing it. And he had it on so I could just go into that, uh, <laughs> that world whenever I liked and have the hallelujah chorus going in my head. So it didn't really seem to bother me. But in the daytime, I remember being sent to bed and I woke up and there was an angelic being, beautiful at the end of the bed, who spoke to me and said, you are going to get better. That's all. So I thought, oh, okay, that's good. That's better than what I heard in the hospital when I wasn't meant to be listening. That's okay. So I went and told my parents. My mother burst into tears, couldn't move for a while, and my father got into a, a, a state of anxiety, like, where's the angel? Why didn't you call me? Why didn't you talk to it? And so I was marched back in to look for this, this presence, but it was not there. And to this day, I have excellent health. The angel spoke, you are going to get better. Now what is the message in that? Clearly, when I talk to people about that, and even when I'm talking to you today, the message is clearly that God has our lives in his hands. And in a moment, he can touch us and heal us, whether we are three years old, 30 or whatever. Our lives are in his hands. And that realm beyond the natural is so close. That angel was so close and I felt it. Never seen the angel again, but felt it with me through all the days of my life. Isn't that awesome? And I'd never been to church. We never went to church as a family. I didn't even know but it was familiar to me when it appeared, when it spoke. The other story I want to tell, and there's many others as well of where I've seen beyond, is um, after we finished our family, Brent and I, with the five, I became pregnant with another babe. And this 
didn't go well because Brent had sort of put a full stop to having any more children. It was too chaotic for his sensibilities or sensitivities. And um, so there was that question had arisen between us. And there was also the question of how I began losing the baby, which was because he was away and we had to hire a car because the car broke down and um, a child was sick in the back, so I had to haul the seat out. And so then I was... Um, needed him to come home because I needed to go to the hospital. When I got there, they did a scan, um, an ultrasound. There's this beautiful little babe there, but no heartbeat. So they said, well, Mrs. Douglas, we'll have to take you to surgery to take the babe um, away. And so I said, you're just not going to touch me. I said, at all. I said, I couldn't understand myself because normally I'm compliant. But this day I was not. So they said, I became difficult, and they said, well, we'll just let you sleep a little while, and Brett went home. And so when I woke up, the whole of that room, not just the ceiling, the whole thing was blue, the most beautiful, vivid blue that I was like in a blue cave. I couldn't see the other beds in the room. There was no one else in there, but it was just all blue. And out of that blueness came my father, in, in a facial form, and my brother, who died when he was very young. And they were just there, hovering, looking at me. I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm loving this. Not at all frightened. This is, God has opened the heavens to me. And from my body came this little girl and hovered there with her, brown hair. I was able to call her. Her name was Anna. I told her I loved her. Then the three of them, after some time, just drifted back up. They were gone. The room started to slowly come back. And a nurse came in and I said, it's all right, she's gone now. I said, her name's Anna. You can take me to the surgery. You can do whatever you need now. Her spirit is gone. It was so real. Now, when I'm speaking that, I can see tears in some of your eyes also because you've had these experiences. But I tell you this, seeing beyond brings a level of freedom and a level of truth that, that you cannot even imagine. And I was in another space for days over this. Those issues that I referred to earlier between Brent and I never eventuated. There was peace in this situation. And here I was with five children, and I'd never even asked the question of God, what happens to the unborn spirit of a child? I know what happens. It's already formed, and it's already in eternity, along with my father and my brother and my mother now, and one day I will be there with her. Come on. You see, this is amazing. I never asked for that, but it was there. When I come to the end of my preaching, I want to pray for any woman who carries grief over the loss of a child because I know I can help you today. But my point, everything that we see beyond the natural is to bring freedom and is to bring protection to people, to people's lives, to their situations, and in Brent's case, into churches. That's why we are prophetic. That's why God shows us things. And we cannot, we cannot take people anywhere that we have not been ourselves. And this is, to me, so essential that, that that realm beyond the natural is something that we are open for, that we desire, that we want, that when we worship here corporately and there's this huge presence of God in this place, that we look for those moments to bring them around our lives and that we do this privately as well. You know... 
this is this is to me. I, I just want to just say that point just one more time, <laughs> because and then I'm moving on. But to me, being able to see, having just that desire, God, open my eyes. Let me see something of where you are, of your presence, your glory, around your throne, or this whole earth, or any of these things. Find the time to be on your own, to be able to receive those moments from God, because he surely wants to show us. I want to go quickly now to the book of Moses, to Moses' life. It says there, he was a prophet. He had huge impact on the lives of so many people. And it tells us there in Hosea 12, verse 13, by a prophet, Moses, the prophet Moses, the Lord brought Israel up from Egypt, and by a prophet, Israel was protected and preserved. So the, the, the journey of a prophet or the purposes of a prophet is to bring freedom and to bring protection. It tells us there in Exodus 7 verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, I make you as God to Pharaoh. Whoa. I make you as God to Pharaoh. It strikes me that you cannot get better than that. So what I'm doing in this part of my message this morning is highlighting the prophet of all prophets, in my opinion, and to give us an insight of what we can do in this prophetic church here, carried by, by the gifts that Brent has on his life and what we can easily walk into to bring freedom and protection to God's people. I make you, Moses, as God to Pharaoh. My goodness. He told him that at the burning bush. He told him clearly this was a supernatural encounter. Moses had been walking and there was the bush, a normal bush that burst into flames and the voice of God was coming out of it. Moses saw beyond the bush Moses saw into the realm of God and Moses heard the voice of God telling him to bring freedom to the people and protection to three million people. This is a serious God who can do serious things in our lives at the most unexpected moment. I'm sure Moses was not expecting this, but God needed a prophet to do something amazing for three million people that were in bondage and slavery with no hope of escape. We are surrounded by that very issue in Avondale here and indeed in our nation because there is not a freedom that will come into people's lives until they know the God that brings freedom. There is not a release from the slavery that people feel with the issues of this world until God can come and set them free and he always uses us as his voice and as his mouthpiece and as the ones that can go into a situation and change it and bring freedom and bring deliverance and protection as it is needed. And here was this man, Moses, who had had to escape, escape from that place and a normal day with a normal voice, a bush, and a normal group of sheep, now hearing God telling him something. I will make you as God to Pharaoh. Oh my goodness. Because by only a prophet could bring a change to this situation and bring these people out of Egypt. It tells us, there in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3. Now Moses was very humble, gentle, kind, and devoid of self-righteousness, more than any other man on the face of the earth, it says in the next verse. Whoa, did you ever know he was like that? 
we've been influenced by Hollywood because we see him marching around somehow as a statuesque figure with a grumpy look on his face and a rod in his hands most times, battling against Pharaoh and every other thing that he had to do. But here it says here in Numbers, Moses was very humble. The characteristics of a prophet who God begins to show things to will have humility, will be gentle, will be kind, and will not be self-righteous. Just remember, that's what this man was. Here he was at 80. And this should be the nature of a prophet. And so it was, he went out from that experience where he had seen beyond. The journey of this prophet is incredible. He had seen beyond that burning bush. He had seen that his people needed to be freed and he began his own journey back to do something about that situation. Sometimes, even with all of that, God speaking, God showing us things, seeing beyond, hearing his word, being called, it doesn't always initially work out. In fact, sometimes things can almost get worse. Tells us here in Exodus 5, verse 22, that in one of the exchanges, Moses said to God, turned again to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought harm and oppression to this people? Why did you ever send me? I cannot understand your purpose. Where is the burning bush gone now? Where is the prophet Moses that is supposed to get this situation sorted out for God? He's turned on God. He's now said God's made things worse and that he's harmed and oppressed the people. And why have you done this? I don't understand. I don't understand why this is so hard. I don't like it anymore. I want to go back to where I was. My goodness, don't be afraid to feel like that sometimes. If the great Moses can feel like that, then I think we have a little bit of license to get some of those feelings ourselves. And some of you have had massive words from God. I've been here if you've had prophecies and things like that. And some days I know you're not quite so convinced about it. It's all right. Don't beat yourselves up because if this can happen to Moses, the most gentle, the most humble, the most called obviously of God to be a prophet and set these people free, it can happen to any of us. And I don't want to mis minimize that right here, right now. This is a bit of an honest message here this morning, but it's going to have a fabulous ending in a few moments because... There are some things about the journey of a prophet that are characteristics of them. It's characteristic of Brent and I and what you've observed of us. No matter whether it doesn't go well, especially in the initial stages of something, prophets called of God don't give up. And mercifully, Moses did not give up. He stood in the, what God had told him. He needed to be reminded a few more times, but he stood there. And he saw beyond. And he saw beyond to what would happen when these people left the slavery and this bondage. When the burning bush is gone, and it's gone away, and in another place, and that moment where God speaks, when that is gone, the passion to release God's freedom and protection to people and situations or other churches remains. Someone who is a prophet never, ever loses that. It's interesting, isn't it, that when these plagues were sent into Egypt over the course of many days, you remember there were the frogs and there were the locusts and there was the something else and the water all went yucky and all the rest of it, Moses was told to bring darkness into Egypt for three days. He stood out there with his hands out, commanded God that there would be no more sun, no more moon, no more stars for three days. Said the people, 
the Egyptians, all of them couldn't do anything. They couldn't even move about without bumping into each other. They couldn't work. They couldn't do anything. But it tells us here, interestingly, that the children of Israel had supernatural light in their homes. Doesn't that tell us something? God will never, ever leave us in darkness, will he? Finally, I've come to my last points. The day of freedom came for these people. They were led by a prophet who had seen beyond. He had touched God in a way that he could never go back from. How many of us have done that? Come on, you know, you can't go back when you've just known God like that. And he had seen beyond, and the under little underworld through Israel would have began to speak and say, have you heard? We're going to be leaving. We're going to be getting out of this place. There will be no more slavery, no more slave drivers, no more bondage, no more cruelty. My goodness, however that happened, the voice of that man, that prophet, infiltrated somehow without Facebook, without Twitter, without TV or radio, infiltrated three million people that simultaneously them and their households began to move. The journey of a prophet, people, I am choosing this moment to tell you, there is no limit to what God can do with any one of us if we are open to see beyond the natural, to hear beyond the natural, and to experience beyond the natural in Jesus' name. And as a group of people, all three million, they moved as a unit. They were free and they were protected all the days of their lives till they got into the promised land. The prophet had spoken and he had spoken and he had spoken over and over again to get this result. I look at it and I think, when I dream, I think, how did this happen? How did these people know to move? I can hardly get my family to move when I had them all into the van to come to church. I see some of you mothers struggling. How did they move? I go back into that time and I think again, oh, the glory. The glory of the Lord would have covered their world there as the waters covered the sea. And because they were God's people and in touch with him, they would have had something of divine guidance and leading in that situation. The prophet Moses brought release, brought freedom and brought protection to so many people millions. And I dream about it. I see it. And I know that Brent and I in this great church of encounter has much more to accomplish in the days ahead and in the next chapters that we are to write in this church. A special thing happened to me last week when I was here. One of the ladies, so precious to us, June Warner, came and told me a story and I'm going to finish with her telling this to you this morning because this has been with me all week. I've known June since I was in my early 20s. And remember we had her come to our um, afternoon tea ladies and she shared her story. But never have I heard you talk about anything as amazing as this. Well, <clears throat> this certainly was amazing in talking about um, looking beyond, and this happened to me. About three weeks ago, my husband was in hospital for about five days and um, getting sorted out by the medical profession. And I was home by myself and just went, just normal, went to bed one night. And I woke in the night 
and I saw this great angel standing by my bed and it was a huge angel. It was um, taller than the, than the ceiling and yet it wasn't stooped over because of course it's supernatural so <laughs> it wasn't confined by the ceiling but it was a angels come in many disguises but this was a um, angel with all its wings you know and um, white and, and huge and I wasn't scared I had to, I, I don't know where I'd, I'd been asleep I just woke up and it was on looking at its side and it turned to face me and said to me I am goodness mercy and loving kindness and I am going to follow you all the rest of your life. Now, um, and I thought, oh, and then it disappeared. And I thought, oh, I know that scripture. That's in Psalm 23, at the, um, the last verse of Psalm 23, where David was saying, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And, um, I mean, that was just so amazing. And to think um, how comforting, how reassuring and um, encouraging that was for me. You know, that was a thing beyond. So um, it was just an amazing experience. Oh, I'm just going to ask June if she wants to stay up here with me. And Claude, you'd like to say something? Here he is. I just want to just share something. Uh, there's a couple just come into the church this morning who I haven't seen for many, many years. Can't see them down there well. Uh, but, but many, many years ago in our ministry, uh, we traveled up to a little place called Moriwa in Northland. And the second time we drove down that street, uh, I, I, I saw these huge angels on either side of the street. And I wonder if you'd like to stand up, please. The leaders of those church are, are here this morning. Would you like to stand, please? And I just want to reassure you uh, that uh, those angels were there for a purpose to give you encouragement uh, that in what you were called upon to do, God was standing behind you in that. And you're going to see, you might not have seen it yet, but you're going to see tremendous success in the things of the Spirit because God has placed his angels of protection around about you and in that place uh, and he's going to give you wonderful, wonderful experiences. I'd like you to welcome this couple, a beautiful couple of church and God. Thank you and I'd like you to be able to pray for them too, Claude. But what we're going to do now is if you want to come forward for healing, we will get the ministry team up, um, or for any situation. I specifically would like to pray for anybody who began to relate with what I talked about of losing a child, because I can pray for you and believe that God will touch you as surely as he did me. And I'm going to ask June to stay up here, because her story, she has come close to something a few weeks ago, that has visited her in her bedroom and there's a, a presence around you, June, that is kind of undeniable. It's still with you, bringing you words of comfort that will remain with you all your days. And if you just want to come up, um, even just to hold her hand, or she may pray for you, she may not, or even talk to her further about it, I would love you to do it here rather than in the cafe because we just have such a presence of God here. But before we move, I just want to pray for us here as a people. Church, raise your hearts, your hands, and your spirits across this place. Lord, I just thank you for the times we find ourselves in here. Lord, I would ask that your glory would not only cover this church, but cover this whole community here. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that many will come and find hope in this place because you are the God of hope and you bring freedom into our lives. Lord, I just ask that the eyes, our seeing eyes, would be open to the spirit realm. Lord, I ask for you to drop songs from heaven once again into this church that we can worship with a fresh flow of your revelation. 
Lord, I ask for every prophetic gift in this place to be activated, to be enlarged, to be expanded. Lord, let us be a people that carry your prophetic words into every situation we touch. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm just going to close the meeting there, but I would like, if you would like prayer for healing, just come up and speak or greet with June. And anybody who would like me to pray for them around losing a child, I'll be up here just like the ministry team to join me. If the pastors from Moriwa could come and Claude, if you could pray for them over there to that side as well, we'd love that. Thank you. See you tonight.